This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So hopefully you've gone through and looked at the first video that covers the basic approach for a group statement of cash flows and also seen a very brief introduction to the question that we're going to go through and look at now from the March, June 2016 sample question, which you know, we've worked out that the question was set in March 2016. Uh, and the question there is called Western, isn't it? Uh, if you go back to what we said earlier on uh, in terms of how to approach the question, uh, the first thing that we need to go through and do is lay out your pro forma, isn't it? So as you can see there, uh, the pro forma isn't about writing out everything. It's just about putting in the headings. So you've got there your operating activities at the top of the first page. Uh, turn your page of paper over to go through there and look at your investing activities. Uh, you then have, is it your third page, which is your financing activities. At the bottom of that third page, you can move down and put in the movement, the brought forward and the carry forward. So ultimately, uh, your movement figure will be a balancing figure, as we'll see shortly. Uh, and then you've got, is it your brought forward and is it your carry forward figure? Okay, those are going to come straight from the SFP. And then you'll need plenty of space for on your fourth page, fifth page, sixth page, seventh page, eighth page, however many pages you need to go through there and do your workings. Okay, remember when it comes to doing your workings, draw up T accounts. Do not be embarrassed about drawing up T accounts. If you want, you can go through there and just draw up a series. Is it there? T accounts. It doesn't matter how scruffy they look, provided that you have them. It will go through there, help you, help the marker, and therefore help everybody. Okay. Uh, so where do we go through and say we needed to start? We said we needed to go through there, didn't we? And start looking at your cash and cash equivalents, wasn't it? So if you have a look at the statement of financial position, I think it's there on page two of the question from the March, June 2016 paper. Uh, you've got there your opening figure, you brought forward the, I think is it as 43, uh, is your closing the 20, uh, and if we go through there and have a look at the movement, uh, is that movement a reduction of 23, okay? Don't add up the totals from operating, investing and financing activities, because trust me, you are not going to get to negative 23 as an outflow, okay? Uh, so just fix it, make it there uh, as a balancing figure, okay? If you can do that, it's a nice start. And what was surprising about this exam, I think if you look at the mark scheme, uh, I think you've actually got one mark available for doing that when in previous group statements of cash flow questions uh, that we've seen at this level, there was no marks available. So, so that's a good start, isn't it? Okay, so as you go along, tick off. Your figure. So you've ticked off your cash and cash equivalent figure, haven't we, on the statement of financial position? Done it? No, do it. Okay. Yes. Uh, then what we go through and do is we look at is it your profit before tax? So we go through there, don't we, and take PBT. PBT is there right at the very top of your operating activities, isn't it? And you will find it there, is it, as 183. OK, put it in brackets. Don't go through and put the number straight in there. Why? Uh, because it will require adjustments on, on the more recent past exam questions on cash flows. There have been adjustments required to profit before tax. It's where the examiner can test you if there's any, any errors that have been made. And upon correction of that error, we need to adjust the profit figure. OK, so again, tick off the 183 from your profit before tax. OK. Uh, once you are there with PBT, what did we say? Where did we look? We look up, don't we? Uh, so when we go through and look up, first thing that we see there are some non-cash items. So you've got there your associate. So your associate, uh, that there is that 16. If my pen works, there we go, that's better. Apologies. Uh, so what you've got there is that is 16 of profit. It's non-cash profit, isn't it? Uh, so therefore, we deduct that in our reconciliation within our indirect method. To get back to a cash figure, we need to remove that profit. 
Uh, we've then got as well, is it your finance costs? Your finance costs are there as an expense of 23. It's a non-cash expense at this moment in time. So therefore we add back that expense to get it to a cash figure. Okay. Uh, the issue that we've then got there is to work out what cash figure is then related to those particular aspects. Now, what you've got there is that your finance costs, and you don't need to write this there in the exam, but your finance costs, this is just me doing a bit of teaching and explanation. You need to work out your interest paid on your associate. Is there there? Any dividend received as a cash inflow. Okay. Uh, the interest paid goes within your operating activities. Uh, the dividend received from the associate uh, goes there, doesn't it, within your investing activities. Uh, so what I would do is within your operating activities, leave yourself plenty and plenty and plenty of space. And at the bottom of that first page, somewhere towards the bottom, uh, I would put my interest paid. And I know there that my interest paid is 23. Uh, I can't see any opening or closing interest payables. So I'm not thinking that there will be an adjustment, or at least I wasn't until I read later within the question. Uh, but for now, just leave it in brackets at 23. And then if you want to get yourself ready for later on, uh, you will then have is it your tax paid, which you will do in, the, in a moment as a working, and then we'll be able to net everything off. So those two figures should be at the bottom of that first page. Okay. Uh, we then need to go through there, don't we? And start to look at your associate. Your associate there as part of, is it your investing activities? Okay. So what we've got there, uh, as part of my associate, we will have our dividend received. Okay. Uh, and what we can remember, if you go back to when we first introduced this question in the previous video, if you go back to part number three of the additional information, that was everything to do with the associate, wasn't it? Uh, so it says that Western purchased a 40% interest in an associate for cash on the 1st of February 2015. Now, just think about that date. The 1st of February 2015. If our year end is the 31st of Jan 2016, then that cash purchase took place on the first day of this accounting year. So we also need to look there. It's a cash outflow where you have purchased your associate. So there's two figures uh, that we need to look at. Uh, if we read on, it says the associate paid a dividend of 10 million in the year ended the 31st of January 2016. Well, we own 40% of that associate and 40% of 10 works out there at four. That's the dividend that we have received. So therefore that is an inflow, isn't it? Okay. So how do we get this purchase of associate? It doesn't say uh, we purchased a 40% interest in an associate for an amount of money. So we need to work out the cash outflow. How do we go through and do that? We go to our workings. OK, so if I go through there and have a look at my workings and what we've gone through and done, this is the important bit that you use your T accounts. So head it up there with your associate and your T account. And this shows that you know what you are doing. OK, do you understand the world of accounting? Because what you've got is you're linking the SFP opening, closing to a cash movement and a profit or loss movement. So what we've got there, if we take the figures from the SFP, the opening figure for the associate was nil, wasn't it? If you go through, look at your associate, it says investment in associate 2015 was nil. So all the brought forwards in the question are going to be in relation to 2015. The carry forward, 
which is the 2016 figure, is there, is it? As 102, isn't it? Okay. So how, how do we work out the purchase figure? Well, we know that we have received a dividend of four, haven't we? So you're going to go through there, debit the bank with the amount received, and then credit your investment and associate. If you want to think debits and credits, I think sometimes it's, it's quite handy to think about it. You receive the cash, you debit the bank, you receive some of the assets, so the cash from the associate. So you reduce the investment in associates. Okay. Uh, so reducing it there by the four. Okay. Don't forget that you've got, is it your profit figure? that comes from the statement of profit or loss. So remember, you look at your cost plus your share of post acquisition profit of the associate when you equity account. And this period share of post acquisition profits coming straight from the statement of profit or loss is 16, isn't it? So when you go through there now and balance it up, you have 106 on the right, Balance it up with 106 on the left. Does that give you 90? That balancing figure there is the cash that you have paid to acquire the subsidy. So careful, the associate. Okay. So when the question said there, didn't it, in part three, uh, that you have purchased for cash on the 1st of February, the amount that we paid there was 90, wasn't it? Okay. So if I go back there to my investing activities, I've got the, is it an outflow of 90? Okay. Everybody reasonably happy uh, with what we have there. Okay. Sure. Positive. Excellent. Because I'm not saying that's ridiculously straightforward, but it is something that you should be adept at being able to do. It crops up in nearly every cash flow question that there is something to deal with with regards to an associate. Remember, it's one of the newer aspects, isn't it, as part of cash flow and group accounts. Okay. So what have we done? We've looked at PBT. We've looked up. We've gone through there when we've looked up at PBT. We've adjusted for the associate. Uh, so we've worked out there the dividend received. Uh, we've looked at what the interest paid is. So, so we're doing reasonably well so far. Okay. Uh, what you've then got once you look up, remember you look down, don't we? Okay. So you've got to be brave when you go through there and look down, uh, because the first thing that you go through and see there is your tax expense. So what I would do there is I would draw up a T account. That T account I would head it up there as tax. Okay, remember tax is a liability, so I am going to reconcile my brought forward on the credit side to my carry forward on the debit side, aren't I? Okay, uh, what you can see there, remember, is you have is it your tax expense and your tax expense there is that there as 40. Okay, so I'm going to put in my profit or loss. My tax expense is that the of 40 because you have debited profit or loss and effectively credited your tax payable, haven't we? Okay. I then need to put in the opening and closing balances. So let me just double check what we have there. Opening balances, I think, on your tax are, is it 41? Careful, just double check. Uh, opening, sorry, 92. And... 15. Okay, so let's just check my calculation. Yes, you've got that opening. Is it 92 and 15? The 92 relates there, is it to the tax payable? Uh, and the 15 relates there, is it to your deferred tax liability? Uh, the carry forward tax payable is there, is it as 47? And the deferred tax liability is there, is it as 14? Okay, excellent. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, so I've got some of the easier bits. What I would do as well, uh, in the back of my mind, I know that there is a disposal that has taken place within this year. So therefore, I would look at, is it part one? 
just very briefly. So from part one, there is a disposal. There is a deferred tax liability that has been disposed. So if that has gone, we need to remove it, don't we, uh, from the accounts. Okay, so tax is a liability. So I'll remove that liability, that credit, by debiting the tax account. Okay, uh, excellent. There are quite a few other complicated aspects that will arise within that tax T account. So I shall leave it there for now. Okay, uh, that will suffice. Okay, uh, other bits and pieces that you could go through there. Uh, remember when you went through and looked down. Uh, when you look down, if we go back to the statement of profit or loss, uh, when you look down, we've dealt with the tax. Uh, you've got there, is it some discontinued operations as well? Uh, it's up to you what you want to do with that discontinued operation. So there's a negative loss there. Is it a 25 for the year? Uh, it says C note 2. Let's have a quick look at note 2. See if there's anything in there that, that might be of any interest. Uh, it says the loss for the period from discontinued operations in the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income relates to Northern, which was the the sub disposed of in part one and can be analyzed as follows. So it tells me there that there is some profit before tax. So the group profit before tax isn't just the 183 from the continuing. We need to put in the discontinued operations PBT as well. OK, uh, it's made profit. It's contributed to the profit. So it needs to go in there, doesn't it? Uh, there is an income tax expense. So that's quite useful because if we go in there, and look at the tax expense. There is tax from the discontinued operations, which is those two. So normally we would show 42, but we've shown 40 in continuing and two within discontinued. Okay. Uh, there's also a loss on disposal. Okay. Uh, loss on disposal, that's non cash, isn't it? Uh, so any loss. On disposal, we're going to go through there and add that back, aren't we? Okay, uh, so that's a loss there, is it? Of 29. If you've added back that loss, you're going to get yourself a mark. Uh, fairly straightforward, isn't it? And all of a sudden, just in part two, you, you, can, you can tick it off because we've dealt with everything there uh, to do with part two, which you know I got from, from following the, the, the tried and trusted method of looking up and then looking down. OK, uh, as I go through and look down further, I see a little bit of other comprehensive income uh, to do with remeasurement gains on the defined benefit plan and the pension. So I might come back to that a bit later. And then the important bit is that you then see the profit and the total comprehensive income split, isn't it, between the owners of the parent and the non-controlling interest. Now, remember, when you look at the NCI, that will give you the dividend paid to the non-controlling interest okay uh, so what we need to go through and do there again linking the sfp linking the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income uh, i've got there is it my brought forward nci from the sfp is 85 uh, the carry forward is there is it as uh, 64 okay uh, the figure that has alerted me to this is that I have some total comprehensive income, which is there, is it as 11? Okay. Uh, so you can see that at the bottom of the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, uh, the total comprehensive income of 121 from the group has been split 110 to the parent and 11 to the NCI. Okay. Uh, what I will then need, okay, uh, is I will need to look at what non-controlling interest there has been on disposal and then my balancing figure will be my cash okay uh, and that balancing figure there will be my dividend paid okay uh, the disposal the non-controlling interest i will thought i would need to do another working for that and possibly as it's to do with the disposal that's going to come with part one so i shall I'll just leave that for the time being, shall I? And come back to it just that little bit later on. Okay. Tough, isn't it?
Okay, you've got to have this ability to say, right, that's tough. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to come back to it later. But what I've done is if you go back to our general approach before, we've done the majority of it, okay, in terms of the cash, the PBT, looking up, looking down, okay, finish your income statement, leave it, okay, move on. Because what we can go through and do now is we can begin to go through there and look at is it the working capital, okay. Uh, that's what I would look at next. So when I'm going through there and thinking about is it my working capital, okay. Now it's part of my workings, I'll just put there, working capital. Uh, it's a standard working, isn't it? So you need four columns, leave the first column blank. And then we have inventory, we have receivables, and we have payables. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, hang on a minute, there was something funky, wasn't there, earlier on, to do with my payables, I think in part eight. I haven't got a clue what it is, I haven't read it, okay? I've just left it in there thinking, right, there might be something that comes to me that I need to adjust for. But forget about that for now. We just need to put in the brought forward figures. So for inventory, it's 165. Receivables is 104. Payables is 41, isn't it? There was a disposal. We disposed of Northern. So we need to remove the balances from the movement. The balances are contained within part one. Okay, the additional information. So use these because this is familiar to us. So the disposal, we disposed of 38. The receivables, we disposed of 23. The payables, we disposed of 10. Okay, so what you've got there is that my expected figures there 165 less 38. And I've done it right, I think that's 127. My receivables are 81, and my payables. Are 31. Okay. My actual from the SFP. So if you like, your carry forward are 108, 106, and I think it is the, is it 36? Okay. Uh, based upon that, what we can go through and then see. Is that you then have to work out your your movement, okay? Uh, so when you're looking at the movement, it's from your expected to your actual, isn't it? Okay. So what you've got there, we expect it to be 127. The actual was 108, so that there is a decrease of 19, okay? Uh, so a decrease on your inventory means you sold more inventory. So therefore, there is an inflow. Okay. Uh, on your receivables, there has been an increase is it 25. So an increase in receivables means that you have been slower at collecting the cash in from your sales. So therefore, there is an outflow. Okay. Is that there of 25? Okay. Uh, what I'm just going to do is because there is a little bit going on with my payables that we see in part eight later on, uh, I'm just going to leave that for the time being. Okay. Uh, but what I'm going to go through and do that is that I have got, is it, and again, there doesn't need to be any particular order in which these balances appear. Uh, I have got the, is it, My inventory is there, is it as 19? Positive, because there was a reduction in inventory. Receivables, again, I'll reference it to my working. Uh, there was an increase in receivables, which gives you, is it an outflow? Is that the 25? And then you've got, is it your payables? Which we're going to leave blank for the time being, okay? Excellent. There we go. Okay. How's everybody doing? If you're struggling, stop. Go over what we've done already. 
and make sure that you're happy with that first, okay? And then start the video again. Understand? Good. So let's start again, okay? Let's make sure that we're happy now. Uh, so we've gone through, we've looked at PBT, we've looked up, we've looked down, we've looked now at the working capital movement. So now it's a case of going to the SFP, having a look at the SFP, looking at some particular balances that you think might be easy, things that you've done before and working it through. OK, uh, so there's no hard and fast rules as, as to which balances you should be looking at. OK, you now if you look at the, the bottom of the SFP, let's just look at what we've seen so far. Uh, we've dealt with the current tax payable. We've put the opening and closing within a T account. Uh, we've dealt with the trade and other payables. We've dealt with those trade and other payables there, haven't we? Okay. There's an adjustment that comes later. Uh, the deferred tax liability, we've dealt with that uh, as part of the tax. And then there are two figures there. Uh, one, long-term borrowings. And two, your retirement benefit liability. Now, the retirement benefit liability is pensions. We'll leave that until later on. Uh, just look at your long-term borrowings. OK, your long term borrowings have decreased, haven't they? OK, they've decreased from, is it 48 down to 26? And if you cast your mind back to the additional information, there was nothing else there, was there, about your borrowings? OK, so the only movement on the long term borrowings must be a cash movement. If the borrowings have gone down, we must have repaid them. So we have the your repayment. Of your borrowings. Uh, you don't have to write it in, but it's there, isn't it? 48 less 26. Okay, that's the movement on my borrowings. That goes there. Is it within financing activities? And is that there? Just double checking. That there's 22, isn't it? Okay, yeah, double check. Uh, you know, if, if you're thinking about that in terms of the overall exam, don't miss it out. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. You know, within there, later on, I still need to go through that. And look at your dividend paid to the NCI. I'll reference it to a working. Yeah, that's hard. I'll have probably got some mark from it already, looking at my working. But I can leave that to later on. But, but you know, follow through your methodology. You've now thought of all the liabilities apart from the pension one. I'll leave that. I might do it a bit later. Okay. Uh, if you go through there and look at the equity and liabilities, the non-controlling interest, but we've dealt with that, haven't we? Uh, the other component of equity, we will see that afterwards when we deal with the pensions. Share capital is the same, so there hasn't been any issue of shares. Uh, the cash and cash equivalents as we move up into the assets, we've looked at that, haven't we? The financial assets, if you're looking at that, you must be stark raving bonkers, believe it. Uh, trade and other receivables, dealt with it, inventory, dealt with it, uh, and then we're into the non-current assets. So there's a lot going on within there. Uh, you've got the investment and associate, we've already dealt with it. Uh, other intangible assets, so we know that there's a, a part of the question that deals with the intangible. So is that the part five? So that, that, that was a short part, which was quite short, so not a lot to deal with. So we'll look at that in a minute. Goodwill, yeah. um, no. Uh, and then PPE, okay. Uh, you know, we deal with PPE quite regularly, don't we? So if I was there within the exam, I wouldn't be panicking. I'd be thinking, well, I've done quite a bit. Okay. If you look at your answer, flip through it, it looks quite blank. It will rapidly get populated. So another T account. Draw it up. Property, plant and equipment. Okay. If you go through there and look at, is it your property, plant and equipment. What have we got? You've got there is that you brought forward. So your opening PP on the debit side is there 386. Uh, your closing property plant and equipment is there on the credit side at 352. Hopefully it will all reconcile up later on. If it doesn't, so be it. Uh, what have we got? Let's go through there and have a look at various bits and pieces. Uh, so here with property, plant and equipment, we are looking there. Is it at part number six to help us out? It says there were no disposals of property, plant and equipment during the year except on the sale of Northern. So 
there's been the disposal of the sub. What did they dispose of as a balance? The property, plants and equipment was there, disposed of at 80. Okay, fantastic. Uh, then it says depreciation for the year was 20 million. So I've got there my depreciation reduces the carrying value by the 20. Just be careful. Don't miss out on the easy mark. Depreciation is a non-cash item. So therefore, when I go to my first page, which is getting nicely full, I put in, is it the depreciation? The depreciation was a 20 million non-cash expense. So non-cash expenses get added back, don't they? Again, in the grand scheme of things, that there is pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. All good so far. What will happen is when you balance it up, your balancing figure there will be your cash. Uh, and that cash there will be your purchase of property, plant and equipment as you've credited bank and debited your property, plant and equipment. Okay. Uh, that will go there within your investing activities. So you have there, is it purchase of PPE? Reference it through to a working. I would be tempted to balance it off if I was in the exam and think none the wiser of it. At the moment, we're not going to do it. Okay, there's a really, really tricky bit to do with the disposal. Okay, and I just want to make sure that we get everything correct. Okay, so tick off the PPE, uh, tick off the SFP, the opening, the closing, tick off part number six. As I said, there's an additional bit of information, a nasty, cheeky little bit uh, that we will have to add in. Okay, uh, afterwards, afterwards, afterwards. Okay, just bear in mind if you don't put it in, and you were to balance the T account off as it stands. So let's just go back there. If you were to balance that T account off now as it stands, I think you would get, is it uh, 66? Okay. So if you were to balance it off now, you get 66. However, uh, the real answer is 74 because there is an adjustment to make. Now, I haven't got the actual mark scheme. I can find it somewhere on the floor here. Uh, within my recording studio. Let's have a look. Can I find it? I think I can. If I go to the mark scheme, uh, and the mark scheme there, property, plant and equipment, cash flow from investing activities is two marks. Okay. Now, if you go through there and put in 66 as opposed to the correct answer of 74, you'll get one out of the two. Okay. Because that's easy. Okay. Yeah, I know there's this disposal of the subsidiary, but that, that's part of the course you should have that knowledge uh, if you've got one out of two that's 50 percent brilliant you pass that part of the question okay it's not right but you gain credit okay so do be careful uh as i progress uh, i then need to go through don't i i think one of the other balances that we said to look at uh was to look the was it at the intangible okay uh so if i go through there and look at the intangible uh, again, the piece of information that relates to my intangible, was it the part five? Okay. Uh, so I need to link the opening PPE, sorry, opening intangible, which was there, was it at, I think it was 27. Let me just double check. Correct. Uh, the closing intangible is there as 37. Okay, so that's just things from the SFP. Okay, uh, what does it actually say in part five? Uh, in part five, on the 1st of February 2015 to the start of the year, Western commenced development expenditure on product Q. Uh, product Q is expected to be launched during 2017. Okay, so that's in the next accounting period. Uh, $7 million amortization on other intangible assets is included within cost of sale. So We've got there some amortization, which reduces the balance 
0.7. Okay, so if you're thinking about it, you're crediting your intangibles uh, and debiting here, cost of sales. So cost of sales, uh, that's non-cash, isn't it? That amortization. So if I go back, is it to uh, my operating activities? I have there, isn't it? My amortization. Uh, my amortization there was 7 million. That's a non cash expense, exactly the same as your depreciation. So, again, some relatively straightforward marks there. Okay. If I was to balance up, is it the my intangible? You know, I'm not told anything else. I've, I've found my non cash expense, the amortization. If I then go through there and balance it up, uh, 37 and 7 is 44. So 44 on the left hand side. Uh, my balancing figure there is 17. Okay. That is a balancing figure for cash as I have credited bank, debited my intangible, as I have spent money on that product. Was it Q developing it during the year? Okay. So that 17 is the purchase of my intangible. So I have there is that purchase of my intangible. Again, overall, I thought that was a pretty straightforward mark to go through and get. Okay, if you can't get that, I genuinely would have to say uh, that you have an insufficient knowledge of how your cash flow actually works okay and the reason why is because you don't understand t accounts okay you've got your opening asset on the debit side the closing on the credit the amortization you debit the expense within cost of sales here so that's a non-cash adjustment to profit before tax uh credit the intangible with seven and then the cash credit bank debit the intangible there is that of 17 okay Excellent. Everybody reasonably happy with where we are now. Yes. So I've ticked off my associate movement, uh, other intangibles, property, plant and equipment. There's still bits missing to do with goodwill, financial assets, amortized cost. But I think there's something again that you should be able to get regardless of the complexities that are elsewhere within the question, which is looking at your retirement benefit liability. Okay. So if you look at the question uh, and have a look there, is it at part four? Okay. Uh, the key thing about part four now is that you don't actually need to draw up the T account. Uh, why? Because you already have it. If you look at the opening balance of 72 and the closing of 60, that reconciles to the balances that you have within your non-current liabilities on the SFP. Okay, so what you've got to do now is just make the adjustments within the cash flow statement for the balances that, that reconcile. Okay, so reconcile the seventy-two to the sixty, so the eleven, the nineteen, and the four. Okay, so the first one is the eleven. So that's a non-cash expense, isn't it? Okay. Non-cash expenses like depreciation, like amortization. If you revise pensions, you'll get this one quite easily. So you've got there your service costs. You need to add that back again. That there is an expense. So that's reduced profit, but it hasn't reduced cash, has it? If you think about the entries, you debit your service cost and credit your pension liability. So you've got the, is it 11 to add back? It's been seen before in past exam questions prior to this. That should be the pretty straightforward. Okay, you should be able to go through there and get that one there. Okay, uh, the other bit that you've got, again, it depends upon your knowledge of pensions. Uh, what you have then is you work your way down the contributions to the scheme. Okay. Uh, so that is what you have paid into the scheme, isn't it? Okay. So you've got the your contributions that have been paid into the scheme. So you are crediting the bank. 
So you have a cash outflow, don't we? And that cash outflow there is 19. Crediting the bank, debiting your asset, aren't we? Okay. A little bit tricky, uh, but you know, that's an amount that the company is paying into that scheme, isn't it? Okay. So it's going out of the company into the pension scheme. Okay. So it's not an inflow. That there, that cash paid that you have there. is an outflow so do just be very 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 careful there okay uh you've then got the remeasurement gains uh it's a non-cash item but it's a non-cash other comprehensive income item so it doesn't get adjusted there within your profits and effectively there's no adjustment to go through there and make whatsoever okay uh you're then told just underneath the benefits paid in the period by the trustees of the scheme was seven million okay uh we can ignore that uh, because that's being paid out of the scheme, so it's not being paid out from the company. Okay, uh, effectively, they are the benefits paid out. And if you remember the accounting treatment for the benefits paid out, all you do there is you reduce the asset and you reduce the liability, don't we? There's no effect on cash or no net effect. Okay, when you reduce the asset, cash comes in, but then you use that cash to pay off the liability, so there's no overall net effect that you have there okay the rest of the question goes on to say there doesn't it that western operates in a country which only allows tax relief when contributions are paid into the scheme so uh on a, on a cash basis the the tax base is zero which i think it does say doesn't it uh within the question uh but we have made payment into the scheme haven't we which would therefore be the carrying values uh, but the issue that you've got there is that that payment will allow you to save tax in the future, creating a deferred tax asset. But that deferred tax asset and its movement will have been incorporated into this figure here. OK, so that there's nothing to adjust for with regard to the tax base being zero and those contributions being paid. However. And this is possibly one of the hardest bits that you've got within this part of the question. Uh, the tax rate paid by Western is 25%. Now, what you've got is you've got within the movement an actuarial gain. So if you have an actuarial gain, okay, you'll be taxed upon that gain. So what you've got there is there is additional tax expense. Is it there at 25%? of was it the gain of four which gives you is it the one million okay wow we that that was tricky uh if you don't believe that it is one million you only need to look at the difference between the the actuarial gain of four and the figure that is given to you after tax on the statement of profit or loss on oci is it there of three okay now it'd be much easier wouldn't it if they gave us the gain on the other comprehensive income statements of four and the tax effect of one, because we would have adjusted for that tax effect of one. OK, however, here we needed to calculate it. Boy, oh boy. That's very hard. That, that's just ridiculous. OK, so like I said earlier, I wouldn't particularly worry if uh, you didn't get that there within the exam. OK, but again, uh, I'm not going to touch it anymore. I'll leave it. I'll come back to it if, if the need be. A little bit later on okay uh, excellent there we go so how you sat uncomfortably don't be okay if we go back and just look at where we are uh, you know let, let's look at the easy bits we've done quite a lot of easy repetitive aspects haven't we okay you could even say the loss on disposal is easy okay uh, provided that you know where it goes, okay. Depreciation, the amortization, the service costs they were all pretty straightforward, weren't we? Uh, we then started looking at the investing activities. If you know your debits and credits, the intangibles are easy. I thought the associate was pretty straightforward, uh, and, and the dividend received was pretty straightforward, okay. Uh, the repayment of the borrowings that's been pretty straightforward, hasn't it? Uh, looking at the cash figure, that's pretty straightforward. And if you tick off all the E's and say each E, easy mark, 
should be one. You're well on the way to passing. Okay. Bear in mind, you know, I, I've done calculations, haven't I? Uh, for NCI, although it's not complete, it will get me credit. Uh, I've done workings for PPE, although not complete, it will get me credit. Uh, the tax balance, can I find that? There it is. I can go through there and work out the tax figure. It's not complete, but you know, there must be at least two marks out of, is it there? Potentially three that were there within the actual mark scheme that's just down to my left. Okay. So if I look at it as it is now, if you were to finish that off, you've passed. Okay. You have to be proficient. You will improve. You'll get quicker. Uh, it's then how brave you are to go through there and look at the rest of the question. We need to be brave. Okay. So let's go through, uh, have a look at trying to be brave. Uh, and we will try and be brave, first of all, uh, by looking at the disposal uh, and looking there. Is it at what happens on the goodwill? OK, uh, so what have we got? OK, yeah, there's been a disposal, but we've got the, the, the disposal. When you think about the disposal, you know, you need to deduct your goodwill, don't we, when we're looking at the, the, the profit or loss on disposal, okay? Uh, this is just approaching it in any haphazard way, effectively. I'm just looking to, to accumulate marks, aren't I? So here, I'm just going to try and do the easy bits. It tells me about what happened on the date of acquisition, okay? Uh, so I can find out the amount that was paid to acquire the subsidiary. I can work out the goodwill. I think it says in part one as well. Uh, there was an impairment this year. Uh, is it there by the boss? First of Jan, 31st of January 2015, impaired by 75%. Uh, so you know, there's a lot going on. So let's just calculate goodwill. Okay. Uh, so what you've got is we've got the amount paid. So it says there the consideration, I think, was 132. We add on the non controlling interest. Is that the at fair value, which was, I think, 28. I deduct the net assets, which again are there at fair value, and that is there, is it as 124? Okay, uh, that gives me there, is it 36? Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, once I've got that, uh, what did it go on and say? Okay. Uh, at the 31st of Jan 2015, goodwill relating to Northern had been impaired by 75%. Uh, so we've got the an impairment. There is it at 75%. So 75% of 36 is that 27, uh, which gives me is it 9? Okay. So that there is the carrying value of the goodwill in relation to Northern, the subsidiary that has been disposed. Okay. Uh, what I can go through and do then is I can use that nine there to help me with my T account. Okay. This is possibly why I'd have done this first because I need to look at goodwill. I need to look at the movement and the figures given within the information. So in the SFP, I have my brought forward, is it there, of 19. I have my carry forward, is it there, I think, of 4. Okay. There has been a disposal. Uh, that disposal, we've just worked it out as 9, haven't we, just above? Okay. Uh, if I balance it up, 19 on the right. 19 on the left, it doesn't balance. It doesn't balance, is it the line of four is 13? Uh, 19, does that give me six? Okay. What on earth is that balancing figure related to? We'll read the question. Okay. Uh, in that first large paragraph, the second to last sentence told me uh, Northern's goodwill had been impaired by 75%. Uh, we've got rid of the goodwill of Northern and there's still goodwill left. OK, well, it says a goodwill impairment charge has been included with admin expenses for the current year, but does not relate to Northern. So the other goodwill that is there within the group has been impaired and it's been impaired by six. OK, that impairment is a non cash 
item, isn't it? It's an expense. So that non-cash expense, the impairment of goodwill, it's an expense and will need to be added back. Okay, like we did before for depreciation, like we did before for amortization. Okay. Uh, it's not ridiculously hard, but it is quite a challenge just because maybe you're not looking out for it. Okay. Uh, so I, I just have an awareness of how to work out the impairment. I think we have seen it in similar fashion uh, in previous sittings, but, but there we go. Okay. Excellent. Uh, don't give up just yet. Okay. There's still plenty to go through and look at. Uh, what we've got as well, you know, let's go through the uh, and think about is it the disposal? Okay, still in part one. Still in part one, yes. There's been a disposal. If you have a disposal, there is a group profit or loss. We're given the group profit or loss, but the issue that we have is how you calculate it because when you calculate it, you take is it your proceeds? Uh, you add on the non-controlling interest at disposal. We deduct the goodwill. And we deduct, is it there, the net assets. Okay. Excellent. This is where the challenge is. So we know what the goodwill at the date of disposal was. Because remember, this is the disposal. Of Northern, okay. Uh, the goodwill at disposal, we've just worked it out. It's there. Is it at nine? Okay. Uh, we don't know the non-controlling interest at the date of disposal, so I'll need to do a working for that there. Uh, the net assets again at the date of disposal. We will need to do a working for that there. Uh, we do know, however, uh, within the group accounts, okay. There was a loss on disposal, wasn't there? I think in part two of 29. Okay. So if we can work out the net asset to disposal, the NCI disposal as well, we can work out the overall proceeds and the proceeds will be a cash inflow. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's a challenge. Okay, that, that really is. In the exam, forget about it. Move on. Okay, it's just way, 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 way too complicated. But what we've got, as we're chatting it through, let's have a look at what we've got. Uh, let's work out the non-controlling interest at the date of disposal. So a little bit like uh, a working number four on the SFP, isn't it? Okay. Because what we go through and do there is we take the non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition. Okay. Uh, and I think the non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition we've seen before uh, at fair value when we looked at the goodwill. That was there at 28. To which we then need to add on the non-controlling interest share. Is it 20% of the post-acquisition profits? Which we normally look at there, don't we? Uh, from a perspective of looking at it with working number two. And then as we had, is it the non-controlling interest at fair value? We need to deduct, is it 20% of any impairment? Okay, the impairment in relation, was it the, don't forget, of Northern? Okay, so that is... 20% is the impairment previously 27. Okay. So is that the 5.4? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Reasonably happy. It's doable, but it's thinking, well, how do I know I need to do this? Okay. You don't. Okay. It's just practice and a process of elimination okay uh, so we now need to work out is it the these post acquisition profits okay uh, so how do i do that well i look at 
are working too, don't we? So trying to work out the post acquisition figures. Okay. Uh, so what we can go through and do that using the information that you have within the question. So instead of looking at year end, we're going to look at what happened at disposal. Uh, what happened at acquisition. And what happened post acquisition. Okay. Uh, because what you've got, again, let's just go back to the information. It's been a while since I've looked at it because this question's taken so long. Uh, it says the fair value of net asset to acquisition was 124. Okay, excellent. So that there is the fair value. Uh, we need to look at what it was at disposal. Now, this is where it's a little bit tricky because we're not told it. Okay, uh, we need to look at the book value. OK, now, if you go through and total up everything that you've got in terms of the, the carrying value, uh, you should find, if memory serves me right, that it comes to 123. OK, so if you're thinking, where does that come from? Right at the bottom of part one of the information, that effectively is your 80 plus your 38 plus your 23. Uh, less 10, less 6, less 2. Okay, that's the carrying value. However, it needs to be at fair value. Okay, and we don't know what the fair value adjustment is at the disposal date. Okay, uh, so what you've got there is we need to make a fair value adjustment. The fair value adjustment is already incorporated there within that 124. Uh, but what you're told. OK, right at the start of the question, and I think it's in the second sentence, is that that initial 124 million included a fair value uplift of 16 million uh, in relation to plant with a remaining useful life of eight years. OK. Uh, now, if this subsidiary, Northern, uh, was purchased was it on, I think, the 31st of July 2011? And the disposal took place on the 31st of July, was it 2015? Then the post acquisition period is four years. Okay. So if we have a useful life, is it there of eight years? Then the initial 16 uh, will be depreciated over eight multiplied, is it there, by the four years? OK, uh, 16 divided by eight is two multiplied by four is eight. So two fours, eight, 16 less eight is eight. OK, so we have a fair value adjustment, a fair value adjustment that has not been included. It's going to get you now. Whole fire. A fair value adjustment on PPE. That has not been included within the carrying value of the assets disposed of. Now, if I can find it. There we go. PPE part number six. You know, you've got the disposal of the subsidiary that was based upon the carrying value. Oh, oh wow, we yeah, laugh to yourself because you're not going to get that within the exam. Sorry. Unless you're on the ball uh, and don't suffer from any nerves or anything like that, then, yeah, you might get it. But, you know, no nonsense. OK, uh, so you've disposed of 80, but you've also disposed of as well the carrying value of 80 plus the fair value of 8. OK. <laughs> yeah, crazy, isn't it? OK. Yeah. Good luck with that in the exam. As I said, we've done the easy bits. You've passed. OK. Uh, then what you have got as well. Uh, just be careful. It mentions deferred tax. Remember, on fair value adjustments, uh, you do have deferred tax. Deferred tax is 25%. 
so there is the third tax there is it of two okay so there is an extra tax liability <gasps> yes again okay uh we need to go back there don't we find our i think where is it i've lost it we've done so much there we have it uh on your tax yeah uh, you've got the disposal that we had there of six however there is also as well as part of the disposal another deferred tax liability of two in relation to the fair value adjustments okay oh yeah you thought the fair tax was tough you, know, you thought groups was tough imagine marrying them up like we've done here and making it impossibly tough okay uh, no wonder several of you have requested me to go through there and work through this question okay Still with it? Sure. If not, get yourself a cup of tea, okay, uh, and then come back. Because by now you're probably confused as to, as to where or why we were doing this. Why Why did we draw up this net assets working from working too? Well, the reason why is because we wanted the post acquisition movement. Okay, so we've got there, is it 124? Uh, and if I go through there and total it up, 123 plus 8 is that there, 131. Less 2 is 129. So, therefore, the post acquisition movement is as 5. Okay. So, my post acquisition movement is there as 5. So, it is now 20% of 5. 20% uh, of 5 is 1, which is great. I can then total up the non-controlling interest. Was it there at the date of disposal? 23.6. Okay, so 23.6 is the non-controlling interest at the date of disposal. Uh, I can add that in there. Uh, it is in relation to NCI. So do just be aware if we go back to my non-controlling interest working. I did need to work out the NCI at disposal, which is 23.6. Okay. There we go. Uh, excellent. Yeah, that, that, that's how crazy it can be. Uh, so, what am I working out? Uh, well, we're trying to work out the proceeds. I now know the net assets at disposal. Did we work that out at 129? Okay. Uh, so if you work out the proceeds as a balancing figure, uh, you've got the, I think, is that the 85.4. Okay, that is my proceeds as my inflow. Okay, however, just be careful. Uh, that excludes the overdraft. Okay. Uh, so what you've got there is within your investing activities, uh, you have that, is it the disposal of the sub? We've just worked it out at 85.4. We've also got rid of an overdraft at 2 million, which is highly beneficial. It means from a cash perspective, we have more cash as we now no longer owe that money to the bank. So that the, the two is the overdraft, which gives me is it 87.4. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, if you got that, it was five marks. Genius. Well done. Straight to the top of the class. Okay. Uh, Very, 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 very hard. Okay, ridiculously hard. Uh, too hard for us. Move on. Okay. Uh, I don't even know how long we've been going now on this question. Okay. Ages. You've only got just over an hour. Okay. So um, there we go. Shows how ridiculous this question actually was. Okay. Have we got anything left to do? Yes, we have. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Okay. Uh, so what we've got to go through and do is there's a, a couple of bits more to deal with. Uh, is it part seven and part eight? Okay, so is it there in part seven? Uh, part seven of the information. Uh, 
was the, the financial asset, wasn't it? Okay. Uh, so again, draw up a T account. You might find this ultimately a little bit easier. I don't know. We shall see. So your financial asset from, is it the part seven? Okay. You've got the, is it your brought forward? Is there as nil, isn't it? Zero, nothing. Uh, you've got the, is it your carry forward? And again, your carry forward is 19. Okay. Uh, what are we told within there? This is where we need to go through and break it down. It says the financial asset at amortized cost is a 20 million two year loan. Uh, which Weston gave to an unconnected company on the 1st of February 2015. Okay, uh, so what we've got there is that if you're trying to get the easier bits, uh, you've got there is it 20, okay, uh, in terms of the amount that you lent, okay, so you've debited financial asset, credit, cash, okay, uh, so what you've got there within your investing activities you've got the your investment in debt okay whereby you debited your financial asset credited the bank okay so that's an outflow is it of 20 okay uh, what else are we told there within the question uh, the 12 month expected credit losses were £1 million and have been charged to admin expenses. Oh, wow. That £20 million wasn't too bad and this one isn't too bad now. So what you've got there, uh, you've got your expected credit loss. Is that the one which you know, works out well, doesn't it? Because it brings everything down to the 19 that we would expect. But what you've got there is that credit loss is a non-cash expense, isn't it? Okay, so what we've got there is that you've got your credit loss. You can add that back in as it was charged in admin. It's reduced the admin, but it hasn't reduced the cash. So we can add that back in. Okay, all good. Yeah, it's not so bad so far, but there's just a bit of an issue, isn't there? Okay, everything balances off. So you think, right, we're done. We're dusted. There's nothing else to deal with boy oh boy you'd be wrong there wouldn't you okay let's just move that up what have we got uh it says the coupon and effective rate of interest were both eight percent okay so the interest at eight percent on 20 million is that they're 1.6 million per annum uh, the interest was received on the 31st of January 2016 and recorded correctly in the consolidated financial statement so there's nothing to deal with there everything has been dealt with uh, and it goes on to say there in the consolidated financial statements, despite a significant deterioration in economic conditions within the industry of the unconnected company. So there is therefore uh, an indicator that we're moving into the stage two, isn't it? OK, uh, of our credit losses over the lifetime. Uh, so it says that as a result, the investment is to be downgraded with an expected 40% chance of default on the remaining cash flows and no entry has been made to downgrade the investment in the consolidated financial statements, okay? Uh, so what have we got? Uh, well, if we're moving into the second stage, we need to look at the present value of the expected cash flows. So we're into year one of the two. So the interest that we would expect to receive uh, would be the, is it 20 million multiplied by 8%. So is that 1.6 million? Uh, we also have as well, is it the principle of 20? So we would expect to receive 21.6, wouldn't we? Okay, if everything went according to plan. Okay, however, uh, it is not going to go according to plan, is it? So we are only going to receive, is it 40%? So 60% needs to be there for, careful, let me just double check. 
40% chance of default. Okay, so the remaining 60% is what we expect to receive. How much is that worth in present value terms? Well, if we discount back at the expected rate of return, is there 8% so the effective rate of interest? Then what you have there is 12. Okay, that's what it should be. However, it is not, is it? It is currently there, isn't it? At 19. Okay, so if that's the case, then what we have is a seven million dollar impairment, which has not been accounted for. Okay we need to account for it okay so therefore what's going to happen is on your profits before tax you will deduct the impairment of seven okay uh, there we go so i think that ends up with your pbt at 182 okay very hard and then what you've got as well is it's a bit crazy but this is what you would need to do you then need to add it back, wouldn't you? Because it's a non-cash expense. So you've got then, is it the impairment of the financial asset, which is there as seven. Okay. Again, it is a non-cash expense. Therefore, add it back. We don't just ignore it because it hasn't been accounted for. We need to account for it and then work it out as a cash flow. Okay. I think in the answer at the back, you see that as a combined eight and there's some form of explanation in there as well okay that's just a little bit different okay uh, again i think given that all your expected credit losses are reasonably new at this point in the syllabus uh that's quite hard isn't it okay i think the actual credit loss that we had was easy wasn't it okay pretty straightforward okay happy with that there good 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 I think I haven't missed anything out uh, at this point in time. Uh, it will all become clear at the end, won't it, when we finally total it all up. Uh, then what we've got is to deal, I think, with this contingent consideration. If you look at, is it part eight? Okay. Uh, it says, included within trade and other payables at the 31st of January was contingent consideration of $10 million. Okay. Uh, what you need to do is if we go back to our working okay you know we need to deal with the movement on this contingent consideration separately it was in uh the your your payable so it was included within here okay so what we're going to go through and do now is effectively we're going to change that up okay we're going to remove it because we're going to deal with it separately so by taking out the 10 that takes it to 31 if i deduct the 10 that gives me 21, which takes me to 36. Okay. So what you've got there is if I now look at the movement on the payables or trading other payables, excluding this contingent consideration, what you get there is it 15. Okay. Uh, so that's an increase, is it there, of 15. If you have an increase, uh, is it there within your payables? That's a good thing, isn't it? As we have more cash. Okay. So there I have an increase in payables. Is it there 15? Okay. Uh, I think that bit there is pretty hard, isn't it? Hard because it was new, it was different. I don't think it's anything that's been seen before. Just bear in mind, I think there was four marks overall for the working capital. One mark, I think, was it there for receivables? One mark, was it there for inventory? So that's two. Uh, if you got, I think, a movement of five on payables as opposed to 15, you get one. If you got 15, you get two. Okay, so I think the scope there to get three out of the four, which is 75% of the marks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just to go through, finish it off, uh, we need to actually look at that contingent consideration in full. And does anything fall out from it? Uh, so I've got the my contingent 
consideration was that the part eight. I think it's part eight. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're told uh, it was 10 million, wasn't it? So it's a liability. Is your contingent consideration? So I'll put that in as a brought forward. Is it there of 10? Uh, what happened during the year? Okay. Uh, well, it seems to have been settled, doesn't it? Okay. It's all been paid out. So at the end of the year, it is nil. Uh, remember, on your contingent consideration, you unwind the discount. So here, there will be interest that we need to unwind. So that's the 10 multiplied by, is it 10%? So does that give me, is it 1? Okay, as I credit the contingent consideration, debit my interest expense. Now just be careful, uh, that interest expense is recorded in your interest expense, but isn't a cash figure. Okay. So therefore, I need to remove from that expense one uh, to get the interest actually paid, uh, excluding the unwinding of the discounts. Okay, so then that takes it down to 22, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it does also go through and tell me within part eight uh, that the amount that we paid was there, was it as seven? Okay. Uh, so it's not a balancing figure, it's just a seven that we go through there and include, isn't it? Okay, so that's a cash payment. It's a cash outflow, credit, bank, debit, the contingent consideration. So it's a payment. I don't think you'd be penalised if you put it elsewhere. Uh, you might have put it in operating activities. It's technically part of investing activities. That there is your payment. of contingent consideration and that payment of contingent consideration is there a seven if you see a cash thing a cash item inflow outflow throw it in even if you don't even know what it means okay it was a payment it was cash it's gone out it's seven boom throw it in there okay uh anything else that we need to do I think we need to balance this up, don't we? Okay, so I think, let me just double check back to my workings. I've got this far, I don't want to make any daft mistakes now. So that's 11 on the right, 11 on the left. So when I balance it up, I think that comes in there and gives me four. What is that four? That four, do the debits and credits. I've debited my contingent consideration by removing it, the credit. Just goes to profit or loss, doesn't it? It's a gain, okay? It is a non-cash gain, okay? Uh, therefore, uh, any non-cash gain, okay, uh, will go through there and appear within your operating activities, won't it? Okay, uh, there we have it. So I think one last adjustment to make before I total things up. Uh, you've got the, is it the gain on the contingent consideration is there as four. Okay, be very careful, Christopher, there, because it's a gain, and therefore we reduce the profits. Okay, the gain will have increased the profits. And therefore, we need to reduce the profits by removing that gain. Okay. Excellent. <gasps> wow. I think I've done everything now within the question. Okay. Uh, there's no blanks left in there, are there? No. Uh, the interest paid, I think, is there. Is it as 22? Okay. 23 less than 1. Uh, if I'm looking for my tax paid, uh, if I go through there and total it up, okay, uh, if I total up my tax again, you don't need to put in the totals there within the question. Uh, you can just go through there and just do it on your calculator, but for demonstration's sake, I will put them in. I think on the right it's 150, so on the left it's 150, and therefore when you balance it up, 
uh, your balancing figure for your tax paid should be 81. Okay. Uh, so you can put in your tax paid. Is it there of 81? Okay. Excellent. There we go. If you want, you can go through there and, and, and total it up. I've given up. Okay. In terms of totaling it up. Uh, the purchase of property, plant and equipment. That needs to come from my working. Uh, again, if we go through there and balance that up, be careful. Remember, you've got that really hard bit there, haven't we? with the disposal of the subsidiary and the fair value adjustment that we disposed of. But if you total it up, I think you come to 460. Is it there on the right? So therefore 460 on the left. And then when you balance it up, it is there as 74. Okay. Yep. Okay. So 74, your purchase. For property, plant, and equipment. Okay. Excellent. Don't think there's any other balances to go through and put in there. Uh, the dividend paid to the non controlling interest. Uh, I need to find my non controlling interest T accounts. A bit further back, there we go. My non controlling interest T accounts. Uh, when I balance it up, do I have 96? On the right, so therefore 96 on the left. Uh, the balancing figure for my cash paid, I think, is there is 8.4. Okay. Yeah, okay, 96. Okay, so your dividend pays the non controlling interest is there as 8.4. Okay. Excellent. And if you're crazy enough, you can go through there and total up your financing activities. So total up the operating, total up the investing, total up the financing. And you should then come to the net movement. Is it there that we started off with a good, I don't know, it's probably an hour and a half nearly uh, of negative 23. OK. Wow. What a crazy question. OK. I think the key bit to take from it. Don't sit there now and think, well, I don't want cash flow to come up because I think cash flow is a great area to come up. This question, admittedly, was one of the most difficult cash flow questions we have ever seen. So learn from it. But regardless of how difficult it was, there were still so many easy aspects within there. OK, you know, go back to looking there. The associate, the finance cost, the inventory, the receivable. You know, they were pretty straightforward. And the key bits to take from it as well is that, you know, your tax paid figure was a very difficult figure to get, but you will get partial credit. You know, there was three marks, I think, for the tax paid. You could get at least one or two. Similarly, for the purchase of PPE, to get that figure up there is 74. Again, you do really well to get that 74, but I don't want you to. Uh, I just want you to get the basic figure and get one out of the two or two out of the three marks. OK. You can pass a cash flow question easily. What I would do now is instead of going through and doing a new statement of cash flow question, do this one again. OK, refine your approach. OK, identify what you think is easier than other aspects. Use T accounts. I still think it's the best way and always will be the best way to understand how to work this type of question. But overall, it doesn't matter how difficult the question actually is you will be able to pass okay i guarantee if you follow the rules follow the methodology you'll pass yeah just don't forget that there are two other parts of this question and you need to attempt those as well so make sure that you stick to time other than that not sure about you but i need a break okay so i'll leave it there and i'll see you all again soon take a break yourself too thanks <laughs>